Bill John Baker? Here. Jack Baker? Here. Julia Coates? Here. Bradley Cobb? Um, Joe Crittenden? Here. Jody Fishinghop? Here. Meredith Fraley? Janelle Fulbright? Don Garvin? Okay. Tana Glory Jordan? Present. Curtis Snell? Here. David Thornton? Present. Kara Cowan Watts? Oh, honey. Yep. We do have a quorum. I ask Mr. Councilor Bill John Baker to say the invitation for us. Stand, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, most thank for this day and and keep in mind the the sick and the suffering and the Gail Miller and the pain with her father and, and Wilma and Gina Elia that are in pre-op and and in the hospital. And, you know, have a special thanks and, and lay your hand on those troops overseas that are in harm's way so that uh, they might uh, survive and come home safely. Uh, thank our people and, and their, their suffering in, in this economic times of, of high gas prices and, and high food prices and help us to make great decisions uh, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Mr. Baker. I want to welcome everybody out this morning. I see we have one visitor, uh, Dick to George. How are you? Good to have you. Next, we have the approval of minutes for the May 13th regular session. Do I hear a motion for that approval? So moved. Thank you. Have a motion and second for approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. I'm going to move right on to the reports, and the first one up is Ms. Norma Marion from the Human Services Department, and we have... Yes, Norma's not here today. My name's Linda Woodward. I'm a poor su substitute, but I know you have the reports in front of you, and uh, I will be glad to write down any questions you have that I can't answer so that Norma can get back with you with those answers. So can I help you? Uh, does anybody have any questions for Linda this morning? Yes, yes Ms. Fishing Officer. Can you address the background checks? Uh, the, if, if, uh, let me give a little history on that. The background checks I think that Ms. Fishing Hawk is referring to is background checks for fingerprinting that are required by our foster and adoptive homes. Um, the payments for foster and adoptive homes come through 4E contracting, which is a federal dollar that comes through the state of Oklahoma. So those guidelines are set by the feds in order to get families approved for that payment. Until September of last year, we did OSBI checks and other uh, reference checks and background checks. We also did fingerprinting, but fingerprinting wasn't a requirement for the payment at that time. It was a requirement by the state of Oklahoma because they're the ones that actually pay the dollars for our foster care children that are in care. So, but last September there was a new federal law that passed. It was called the uh, Adam Walsh Law. You know, the guy that does the uh, show on television. Uh, and the law basically was addressing the concerns that people had had for a long time about people that wanted to be foster and adoptive parents and backgrounds weren't um, always complete. People were doing them in a hurry or there were things that had been left out. So, and people move. We're a very transient society. So people for, for different states, so doing OSBI checks or just state checks in those states weren't sufficient. So the law passed. It said fingerprinting had to be done with, through uh, federal fingerprinting had to be done for every family that was going to be approved for foster care and adoption. This happened last September. It's always nice to pass a law, and the law probably was a good one. However, the FBI and those people that give those fingerprints results back to us were not prepared to address that issue when it happened. Before then, we were using the BIA and we were using the state of Oklahoma through DHS to obtain finger fingerprints, which, like I say, we needed to get, but they weren't dependent on payment. Well, now they are. We had fingerprint checks that we had sent into DHS that have still are been out that we've sent in over a year and a half ago, if that gives you any idea of the backlog that we were talking about. So we had to start scrambling when uh, uh, September came around. 
We did various things. Oh, we even had a rumor from CNE that they get theirs overnight, and we were very excited about that. But you call C and I've talked to CNE. We can't piggyback on that because their contract is directly with the Gaming Commission, and it's set up specifically for uh, uh, people that work in the casinos. Uh, the BIA said they couldn't do it. We started looking for other contractors. Uh, we finally found one in uh, about December that said that they, it was out of Arizona that they said they could do them for a, uh, a fee of $40 and they could have them back to us in two to three weeks, which was much better than we had before. So we started using that firm and that didn't quite work out. Uh, for that time limit. In fact, some of them were as long as three, four, five months. And some of them we hadn't gotten back a couple of months ago. The problem wasn't with the consultant. The problem is still with the FBI and getting those fingerprints back from them. So, But things are progressing. We also found a source in Oklahoma City where if the family needed fingerprints or wanted to do it themselves. They could drive to Oklahoma City, pay the fee, get the fingerprints, and we'd have them the next day. Well, we had a set of grandparents do that, and then two weeks later, they didn't do that anymore. Uh, they stopped doing that. They said they couldn't handle the influx that was starting to come in because people had found out about them. So uh, the consulting firm that we have now is about a four to 12 weeks uh, they're doing better. They were like they were longer than that. Now it's it, we're averaging probably about six to eight weeks, give or take. We sent in a packet of fingerprints on the 25th, 5th of May, and we got a confirmation on the 16th or yesterday that they'd received them. And we don't snail mail them. We send them in FedEx. So it's really a lengthy process, simply because um, the FBI is not ready to do this. The other one more thing that we found was yesterday we got a, uh, a, some information from one of our foster parents who also works with the state of Texas. Anyway, long story short, they found another source that they gave us yesterday. It's a source where the family themselves can pay and send in money with their fingerprints. They'll have to get them somewhere else and send them in to some place in West Virginia to some other facility. And they got theirs back in three weeks. So we're also going to share that with our families. But that's about as fast as we can do it right now. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Uh, Linda, did you say this is needed under Adam Walsh for payment? For payment, correct. Okay, now, what if we have a relative placement in a neglect case, mm -hmm. say it's grandma and grandpa, mm -hmm. and they don't want payment. Mm -hmm. They just want to see the children stay in the immediate family, which under... <coughs> Uh, our Indian Child Welfare Act is still our most our preferential our placement. Yes, payment. <coughs> our superior placement. Correct. If they don't want payment, is there a way that they we can go ahead and do the placement without the fingerprints? We could do the placement without the fingerprints, but we can't do the placement without the home study, the OSBI check, the references, and that sort of thing. How, how long does that take? We have about 35 normal, I say normal families, families that aren't relatives, you know, on a waiting list. We have about, then we have the relatives that come in, we try to give them priority. If everything goes well and everybody cooperates and it all does well, sometimes we can do them within about 10 days, but normally three weeks. Is our policy the same right now under the Adam Walsh requirement? Is our, is our policy, does it say everybody has to be fingerprinted? The <coughs> policy... The policy that you have regarding placement temporarily for our children that we pick up... Our internal policy says yeah. that they would have to be fingerprinted if they had not lived the last 10 years in Oklahoma because then we will accept the OSBI if that's for non-payment. Okay. Now, let's say these children have lived or are currently living with Grandma and Grandpa. Mm -hmm. If they're currently living with Grandma and Grandpa, normally they, they wouldn't be in our system. Well, no, let's say you pick up one child for mom mm -hmm. for neglect mm -hmm. or abuse, mm -hmm. and there's two other children. Mm -hmm. Now, I know sometimes all three somehow work their way into the system. Yes. But let's say those two kids are already living with Grandma and Grandpa. 
Uh, what does our policy say as far as removal of those children at that time? It depends on the circumstances of the family. And the family that you're talking about specifically, the, the parents were living in this home. That's where their residence was. The and that's that, the that's difference. That's the reason for yes. the removal. Okay. Yes. If we had, if the grandparents would have said, Mama's got to move and Mama's got to move now because we're going to take care of the grandkids, would that have been an option? I'm going to say something. And, and I, I understand. Okay. Yeah. There are certain comp confidentialities a two-edged sword. And I'm, I'm saying this is like a hypothetical. Well, I and I'm going to give you yeah. some hypothetical okay. answers. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm on confidentiality. When you ask a question, sometimes we can't give you the whole picture. Okay. Right. But the backside of that for us, or the downside of that for us, is we can't give you the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So it looks like maybe that we don't... When you hear from one party and you hear a story, that's not necessarily the story. Okay? Our job is not to our job is to investigate. And frankly, we do a pretty good job of that. The last investigate one of the investigations that came across my desk, we had talked to twenty three different people before a decision was made. It's simply because everybody when somebody wants something, they don't always tell you everything or all. So there's always two sides to a story. There's always another set of family members. There's always a whole lot of information that's not out there. And I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation. When you ask about certain relatives, why can't relatives, grandmas and grandpas, and I'm a granny, so I know exactly what, how that would feel for me. But as an agency that has responsibility for these children, the first thing that we want to be sure is these children are safe and they're not going into an environment, whether you call them grandma or aunt or stranger. They need to be in an environment where they're safe. There are things like child welfare history, criminal background that sometimes prevents us from making placements with these children. There are some hypothetical situations where there are some... Uh, there's lots of sexual abuse. It, you can go on uh, almost any website and find it, but we do it through OSBI and through uh, local law enforcement, through other institutions. And families that sometimes contact you are victims of these kinds of issues. And because they have these kinds of issues, we cannot place with them. But we can't turn around and tell you, hey, we can't place with that grandma because of this. Okay, so it comes down to an issue for me, and, and I'm going to ask you some really tough things right now. Sometimes it's a matter of trust. You're going to have to trust us to some degree that we have looked into those backgrounds and we've made a decision based on what we know that sometimes we can't tell you. The flip side, though, is what if you've looked and there is nothing? Can we hurry that along a little bit? In about, one, in about 10 days to 3 weeks, sometimes we can. We don't run into too many families, especially relatives, that can take on the support of these children for any length of time or for a very long period of time without some kind of financial support. So the fingerprinting still becomes an issue, but actual placement can be made if all of these backgrounds that we look into, the child welfare history, the OSBI, the references, the, all the family dynamics and the home state. And a lot of times with relatives, and this is that hypothetical situation again, is when people are, a grandmother is hit with a situation where the grandchildren have been removed. I want my grandchildren, and that's a natural reaction, okay? But then reality sets in. I can't, I don't know if I can do this or not. You know, I work every day. I'm, you know, there's some, we have some, uh, what's the word, when people go vacillate between making decisions. and So sometimes the delay is people really making up their mind whether they can do this or not. But what about the situation where there is no problem with their background? Mm -hmm. They, they've had the children either prior to the neglect or all during the time they could see there was a problem. They were getting the kids and taking care of them as much as they can. Mm -hmm. They don't need your money. Mm -hmm. And they are the grandparents. Yes. And the children are attached to the grandparents. Absolutely. And the children are old enough that, and we're jerking them out of a family placement and putting them in a non-relative placement. 
Is there anything we can do with our policies to speed things up? I can give you so many examples of where in the past we have speeded things up. And Next it day, out. no. It, didn't it did out. not work out. And that change. they needed the money? No, or? because that speed, uh, there was criminal background check, there was criminal history, there was <coughs> incest, there was. We've just run into. And also the dynamic, we have a dynamic that was not too far in the past, where grandparents, we got a lot of pressure to place with grandparents, okay? Here's the family that we're trying to reunify with. Grandparents don't like the spouse of their child, okay? They've accused this spouse of everything from, you name it, they've accused. can see if they're the accusers. They weren't the original accusers. But what they have done is talk to the children when they had them. They would then tell tales on these people. These people would get visitation. They would tell tales on these people. The dynamic where the children were completely messed up because the people involved had so much anger. So is your, your belief from your department then is the safer way to do it is to just put them in a non relative placement temporarily for say up to three weeks or longer until Short as possible. check everybody out. I have found one of the things that happened to children and what studies have shown is always you want somebody, you want a child to go someplace where they're familiar. It's always better to go to grandma's house than a stranger's house. Always. Okay. But we have found that moving children repeatedly and because you take the relative hop or the, the even the foster care system hop does more harm than that one move. If you can make, if you remove children and put them somewhere and you can make one move back to where they can stay forever if they need to, that is the healthiest thing that you can do for children. How often does that happen though? If you've removed them for neglect or abuse, you're not going to immediately put them back into Mom and Dad's No, I'm talking about with a relative. If, if you've got a relative sitting here ready for placement that they know, and you've removed them for that one ten days to three weeks, and you could actually put them with a relative, it's worth the wait to put them with a relative so that they can stay there. Many times in a knee-jerk reaction, we've had to change that policy because this relative took this child, but they only wanted to take it for maybe a week or two because you know the parents are going to be all right or they didn't believe that that abuse or neglect actually took place to begin with so therefore they didn't protect and you have to be sure that all of those elements are in place because then you start make, making musical stops I mean uh, it's hard to judge what's best for a child but I we have found through experience that making those quick decisions more likely than not are not the best decisions. Councilor Baker. Yeah, and you kind of hit on it, but I have run across several, not just one, but several, where the grandparents wanted them and, and sob story out the gazoo where they needed to come to them only to find out later that the main reason they wanted them was because there wasn't anything wrong with their son or daughter and they wanted to assure access to the to the uh, the one that was being accused and uh, and I think that in their mind they thought they were doing right but uh, but as soon as they got control they immediately gave access to the one that we were trying to keep them away from that is and, something yes and you know mama loves her son or daughter they love the grandbaby too, but I think they're in denial so many times that uh, something's going on. It's hard for them to accept that their son or daughter did something yeah. like this. Yes. And anyway, it, it, it's a really bad situation. Miss Fishman. I just got a question. If I was to go home tonight and die in an accident, mm -hmm. what would happen to my child? <coughs> because you all are Indian Child Welfare and my mother is not in India. We wouldn't be involved in that case. You wouldn't at all? Mm -mm. That's a family decision. Unless there was nobody that came forth. A lot of people have wills that say, you know, I want to, if something happens to me, you know, this person gets them. Let's say you didn't have a will and, and heaven forbid that you, that happened to you this evening. 
your your mother or your sister or your whatever. They wouldn't have to go through no background. Not through us. Okay. Now, they're going to have to go to court to get custody of this child. But that child was not removed from your home due to abuse or neglect. Okay. So that's the only way we get involved. Now, we do get involved in guardianships per se in the sense that... Uh, the law requires that if you were to go into court and file a guardianship for your niece or someone, then the law says that they must notify us. But in most guardianships, that's a requirement. But we, we may intervene in a court proceeding, but we don't have any action because that's a family issue that works out. The only time that we are stepping in is if there is, sometimes it's contested to the point where the child then becomes a ping pong ball and we might step in but in guardianships hardly ever <coughs> so I mean we have the right to and we do intervene it, but we sit back to watch what's going to happen because that's a court issue between families where we are involved is if, if a child has been abused or neglected in some way that's detrimental to that child uh, we're going to take one more question on this uh, from Ms. Jordan then the under at uh, the Adam Walsh law, are there other requirements besides fingerprinting? Can you just kind of enlighten this body as to what the other requirements are uh, that the tribe needed to meet within that? I believe there was a time limit. There was some uh, some other things that came down through Adam Walsh. We didn't really look at Adam Walsh as the instigator. The instigator was really the state of Oklahoma because that's who pays our foster care. So that came down in our 4E agreements. There's there's some uh, references, some some things that more in depth checks. Uh, you have to um, be sure that um, the biggest thing was child welfare history. Uh, we routinely checked that anyway. But what happens when you're checking child welfare history? You can't always get it because, um, oh, there's some legal, you can't always get it. But now it says we have to have it. So we're having to work out some um, negotiations with some of the states to get that information. Okay. But that's the basic requirement. The basic requirement was background. Where do these people come from? What do you really know about them? Uh, what? Who are they really? Because when people... If I'm going to your house to do a home study, the first thing I'm going to see is your best foot. I'm going to see the house, I mean, I'm just going to see everything right. Because you know I'm coming. But that really doesn't tell me who you are. And that's, that was the impetus behind this law. Okay. Thank you, Linda. There's a lot of involved in this uh, in child welfare. Thank you. Next up is community services. Uh, Charlie Self, uh, there's someone representing Charlie. <coughs> Good morning. I'm Beverly Barr. Charlie couldn't be here, but I've come to take some questions back for him if you have any. And I've brought Brian Cooper with Self-Help Housing if you have questions on housing and Billy Hicks from Water and Sanitation. So if you have any questions. Mr. Baker. Uh, how are we coming on the policy so that we can finally start uh, doing the Self-Help Housing? The policies are still being reviewed at this time, and as soon as they are approved, we will get everybody a copy of it. And Charlie will be checking on that when he comes back, and he should be back tomorrow. And has any of the participants give up on us, waiting? Not that I know of. I haven't okay. heard. Uh, I mean, the rain's going to stop real soon. It's going to be a real good time to start putting these things up. But uh, anyway, if we could move that along. Um. Mr. Snell. How about the ambulance service? Has anybody, have y'all discussed anything about the ambulance service in Delaware County? We have no ambulance service in uh, the whole Kansas area? <coughs> have you, uh, I haven't heard anything on ambulance service. Is yeah. that in the community service? I think Charlie was in a meeting at West Island Springs recently. Okay. I will address this question to Charlie and have him get back with you on it. Thank you. Let's fishing off. I've got a couple of questions for you real quick. The deadline for the Cherokee Nation Community Youth Grant. That's how you're all right? Yes, it is. We put $106,000 in it last night. 
when is the deadline? It was July 1st, but they have they have been receiving applications. They said, um, actually, they said they were getting a big stack of them almost every day. So they're going to go through those. They they have. Last night when I met with Sharon, she said they had about 70-something applications that weren't complete. So they were going to start going through those applications and calling the kids to let them know what all they're needing. So we are going to be able to fund them. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. thank you. The other question was, oh, I was wondering, how long have they been working on the policy and procedures? I was curious about how long that's like. Talk about water districts here. That's a question for Charlie yeah, and okay. and he'll get back with you on that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question, Beverly. The other one will provide housing information on number one. It says begin taking applications October the seventh, two thousand seven. Deadline for application is November the eighth, two thousand seven. Yes, I see. I'm that. sure that's a misprint. Yes. But, but what applications were these? The self help housing applications. Is that the one we were talking about, the policies aren't done yet? Yes. Okay. So we've been taking applications since October, and we oh. don't have policies done. Mm -hmm. Harley, I'm not really sure. I don't think that one's the... Wait till it comes up. I don't think that is the self-help housing application right there, and I'm not really sure. I seen that last night. Okay. Uh, okay, I just had a question about that. I was wondering what applications we were talking about there. I was assuming that was the community works project because all the community works, the community buildings, all these reports are combined. I see. But I don't think that's that's not the self help self help housing. Okay. Ms. Jordan. Do you have any idea what is the maybe the area of problem and with the policies not being passed? No, oh, ma'am, I don't. But uh, like I said, Charlie, I, I spoke with him this morning, and he knows that is a concern. And when he comes back tomorrow, he will be addressing that. Okay. Any more questions for uh, Beverly? Okay. Thank you, Beverly. Mm -hmm. Next, we have housing services with Mr. David Sutherland. Uh, the reports uh, should have the report. <clears throat> One of the things we added to the report is, uh, you know, HUD is uh, in the middle of an assessment. Uh, they were last here in 1990 or 19, 2005, and uh, they're here again this year to do an assessment. And one of the things they pointed out was that uh, relatives of, of or employees or empl employee relatives or employees receiving services uh, through Nahasda. Uh, that should be publicly disclosed. Now we've been doing it over to Housing Authority for years, and, and uh, what we do is disclose it at the board meetings each month, read them aloud, uh, and then we mail that to HUD. Uh, so they'll have it. So they pointed out that that wasn't being done, and uh, so we uh, worked out a procedure where we'll disclose them in this this uh, forum, and it'll be attached to my report each month. David, uh, has your procedures for purchase orders changed since the transition from the Housing Authority to uh, Cherokee Nation? Uh, yeah, it, it just it takes a little longer uh, over over here. Uh, well, yeah, it does. It, generally, to get a purchase order um, uh, through the Housing Authority, uh, if it was um, uh, just something simple, three or four thousand dollars, we get a couple of bids, um, pick out the low bid, uh, we'd use tarot vendors if there was one available, generally there was. Uh, we'd simply call the contract manager, she'd issue a PO number, we was good to go. Uh, we go through their purchasing, well, I say go through their Cherokee Nation's purchasing is a little different, it's all uh, via computer. Uh, we have folks that enter requisitions. Uh, they got to make sure all the coding is correct before that gets done, and, and sometimes we have to set up uh, activity codes. Uh, someone has to do that, uh, so it might take a little longer. Not not a lot longer, but uh, uh, we had some issues when we first started, uh, but those seem to be working out real well. Shelly McLean with purchasing has uh, has helped us tremendously, 
and and we're getting some uh, blanket PO set up at different vendors. Uh, we're uh, like if it's uh, MEPA work, which is generally what we have an emergency uh, on, uh, we can simply go uh, pick up the items, uh, which is going to help tremendously. Well, has this length of time impacted our field operations, like our repairs? Uh, on the uh, more on the betterments and additions. Uh, the the emergency stuff it did impact it, but we're getting caught up there. Uh, the better, betterments and addition is where if someone has a house and maybe it's got a carport and they want to enclose the carport and make a, a room out of it, um, and they have MEPA to do that uh, or equity, uh, they can do that. We've kind of put those on hold, but we notified everyone that we were putting them on hold, but we've started doing those again now. How about the repairs on the apartment? Did that take any longer? Uh, it did up front, but it should now. Uh, we're still, you know, we're still working the bugs out, but uh, uh, it's, it's going a lot smoother. Uh, I'd say in another 30 days, there, there shouldn't be any problems. Are, are we using uh, fewer vendors or fewer local vendors now, or is it about the same as when you were in what, the What we hope to do, and, and we're working with Shelly to do this, is set up... Uh, like at No Water, uh, either set up something in No Water or Bartlesville, uh, a blanket PO at one of the vendors there. So if they need paint, they can go get paint. Um, uh, you know, or, or uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, heat and air. You know, if somebody needs a uh, limit switch, they don't have to wait two or three days to get a limit switch. They just go get one, and then all they do is simply call it into the office. They can set up the paperwork. Uh, and get it paid. So we're going to try to stay with our local vendors as much as we can. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. It just, it just no other choice to, especially in this low rent. I mean, trying to, trying to get everything locally here and then getting it out to Bartlesville or Benita or wherever. It's just a real. Thank you. Councilor Soak. Yeah, Mr. Sutherland, on this uh, public disclosure, who's um, keeping track of that? Is that something that that uh, the uh, applicants disclose on a application, or is this something that that you've got somebody that's well, following up on an application, or what can we're you explain this process, or what we're doing here? What we've always done is uh, through the housing authority, we pretty much knew everyone. Uh, what we're going to have to do, and, and we got an applications meeting. Uh, it's Thursday. I think to try and change it to tomorrow. We're going to have to incorporate something into that application where they can check. You know, do you have a relative working for Cherokee Nation? They, we need. We got to know that. And it's just. Is it's it not first degree or second degree. What's the? We've uh, any right now. We've disclosed any relationship. Third cousin, whatever. Uh, not maybe not that deep. I don't. I don't think we've done cousins at all. It's more like aunt, uncle, uh, in-laws, that type of deal. David, can you get uh, clarification on what the law says on that to make sure that we're in compliance? I can. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we're, we're trying to update and, and revise some of the rehab and emergency and all those policies, and I'm going to incorporate that into that and uh, get that clarified. Okay. Councilor Fishing Two questions. I may be wrong. I may be looking this wrong. It says 230 mortgage assistant grants accomplishments. It may be a typo, but wasn't that the number last month? I don't know my book Well, it was through April 30th. It is the same. Okay, I thought it was. Yeah, uh, Commerce took that over uh, on May 1st. And, uh, and you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was. I'm now, they've, they've done, I'm sure they've done some in the month of May. I, I haven't reported them on this. I just left that on there for... Okay, I was wondering because I knew we did like 350 last year, so I was kind of paying attention. To, to be it. honest, I, I've got it on there because at some point I've got a report on it to, uh, as part of the annual report, performance report at the end of uh, or the end of September, the the report they do for HUD. I kind of got it on there to remind me how many we've we've done. And the other question is, uh, you sent us out something on the employees in the Cobra, mm -hmm. and you said we do not have to. Give the 12 to go off the right? We don't have to. That's that's correct. I talked on this other day when we was in the, a month or two ago when we was over in the council house. Meeting. It really bothered me that we let 12 of our employees go mm -hmm. without my insurance because I don't think none of us would have liked to have been gone without insurance. Is there no way you all could be able to buy out or do something with COBRA? Um, of course, COBRA is a, 
an opportunity for an employee once they separate employment to continue participating in the health coverage. Uh, the cost of that has always been picked up by the employee. Um, to, to do that, I, I mean, it's certainly possible to calculate what that would be for 18 months, whether or not the board would be um, entertain that idea. I, I couldn't speak for the board. Um, it's certainly something that uh, if this body wanted to recommend to the board to, to look at, we could put it on the next agenda. Um, don't make that yes, I would like to make that recommendation because I don't think none of us would like to leave here without knowing the insurance no opportunity to pick up insurance. I would like that. Do you like that in the form of a motion? Yes. I hear a second on second. the motion. I have a motion oh, oh, to. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to withdraw my second. I'll second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, a motion is to have the Housing Authority Board to check in for COVID for those people that were uh, out of a job. Well, I, I'm not sure COBRA to, to offer it. I don't, I don't think they could offer it. I think what she was, maybe the way I took it was if. Uh, some type of payment in lieu of COBRA. That would even work for to get insurance. That's, that's what I, when you said buyout, that's what I kind of thought you were talking well, about. Well, I had thought about that. That would work. You want just something for <clears throat> Then I guess the motion would be, Ms. Fishing Hawk, that we want them to uh, at least uh, investigate the, uh, the uh, possibilities of, of helping the uh, employees with COBRA insurance or to find out what their options are. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Aye. I'm stunned. Okay, we have one abstention. Councilor Cobb. When you, uh, when we come back and we discuss that next meeting, can you have all of it, if all possible, in the realm of confidentiality, I'd like to know yes. those people. Are employed. Wait, wait. I'd like to know where they are. Are they employed somewhere else? Yeah. Hmm. Councilor Snell, recognize Councilor Snell. David, on this uh, continue the assembly mortgage program. How, how does that assume? The, um, the assumable is <clears throat> kind of an offshoot of the mortgage assistance. Someone uh, comes and is seeking mortgage assistance. Uh, commerce folks evaluate that uh, family, and if they can get a loan on their own, they say, you know, you need to go get your own loan. You can certainly get a, an affordable loan at a reasonable rate. But it, if they can't quite do it now, but they think they can do it in two or three years, uh, they will refer those families uh, for an assumable mortgage and it simply housing authority uh, finds the financing, gets the, the bank loan, it's in the housing authority's name. We sign an agreement with the family. Uh, after three years they have to assume the mortgage. Uh, I don't know, we're probably close to 10 or 12 uh, on, the, uh, on that program now. I think they sent one yesterday actually. Uh, referred one over, uh, but we've got two or three working right now. I think one uh, Cherokee County. Uh, we're actually doing one under new construction. We're building a house for them uh, here in Cherokee County, and the other one was up in Rogers County. One I got yesterday was in Rogers County. We've done several in Sequoia County. I don't think we've done any up in Delaware County yet, but uh, we're uh, getting more and more of those. Councilor Garber. Thank you. Uh, I had a call this past week for a lady. She's a, on Social Security. Her check's about 700 bucks a month. And, uh, she got a double line. We gave her that 15,000 to close mm -hmm. it and everything. But she's not going to be able to make that payment. The uh, payment's up for over $400 so because of the insurance and the flow of things. Uh, maybe advise her she's going to lose it. And, uh, is there any way she can trade for something smaller? She really doesn't need a double wide, but somebody advised her and got her in over her head. Really. Do you have her information? Uh, I can I can work with Shay, and uh, maybe we can contact her and see if there's something we can. 
Her income, there's no way she can make those payments. And, uh, I don't know how far she is behind. But, uh, if, you, if you can get us the info, we'll, we'll certainly try to outreach to her and see if, if there's something we can do. I'd rather do it now and lose the whole uh, schmacking 15 grand or 10 or whatever we gave her. Uh, if we can't do anything with that 15 grand, do they have to pay it back? Well, Jim, what happens is, is uh, uh, it's on their account. Um, we don't have a whole lot of luck collecting it. Um, but if they ever come back for housing services, yes, they have to pay what's owed. Now, that is a prorated thing. Uh, if, it's, if she's been in there for five years of the ten that's required, then half of it would be forgiven. She would owe the other half. And, and they do have to pay that. We occasionally uh, get that. I mean, if, um, the, a lot of times folks will, will, will uh, lose the house and come right back and, and apply for a, a low rent apartment. And uh, when they do that, then we have the opportunity to try to collect it. And we do that and generally let them pay it out or whatever. There's somebody, we, more often we, when somebody uh, sells the house, they do have to pay it back, and we do get recover that. Okay, I'll talk to you after that. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jordan. Uh, Chairman President, would this be the proper place to bring up the subcommittee that we were going to form on the IHB plan uh, for next we'll year? We'll do that here in just a little bit. If you okay. remind me, we'll bring it back up on the thing. Uh, any more questions for uh, Mr. Southern? Thank you, David, I have one. And, and, uh, what I'd like to have is the income guidelines for the MAP program. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we ever got that. If we did, I've misplaced mine. But, uh, I've got a copy, of, I think, with me. I can uh, have, have them make copies. Okay, you would. Okay, any more questions for Mr. Southern? Thank you, David. Moving on to old business, the C9. So we'll go into new business. And we have a resolution, uh, Department of the Children, Youth and Family Services. Is there someone here to present that resolution? Move for approval. Second. Second. We've got a motion to, to move, to approve, and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, same sign. Moving down to number two, water needs for rural water district uh, status update. Uh, is someone here to present that, Billy? Are you going to... Uh, do the uh, talking on this uh, update on the water systems. I certainly can if you have any questions. Okay, if you want to come forward here, we do have some questions on the thing. Uh, I think uh, just to kind of give us an outline of what we're doing here, we had a request and we have an engineer's report from uh, Rural Water District 8, and uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it and study it all. And hopefully, Billy, that you have and can give us a, an overview of what this is saying and maybe even uh, give us some recommendations on what we should do and what we should follow uh, with this report. Certainly. Uh, we actually have two engineering reports. One engineer uh, report was done uh, from EDM Consultants. Uh, that was done back in, uh, in February of 2008. And then we have a second engineer's report that was done by Kelly Engineering that was done in May of 2008. And basically what, uh, what we've got in these two reports are two uh, very different uh, opinions from these, from these engineers. Uh, we've got the, uh, the EDM consultant report that basically made some recommendations uh, on installing some valves and replacing some, uh, some uh, of the service lines and uh, doing some repairs on some uh, valves going into their uh, tank and uh, what we did we acted on this engineers report and we signed a, a memorandum of agreement with the Briggs to uh, purchase the materials for them for this uh, to carry out the recommendations of the engineers and we also gave them the use of one of our back hose so they could uh, do the installation uh, we had the second engineers report that basically come came back and says that uh, the the uh, the best plan of action is just to replace the whole system out there uh, and the, the attached cost estimate from this engineer is uh, roughly two million dollars to do that. Now what uh, after looking at both of these reports I, uh, I kind of came to a few recommendations. Uh, some of these I've, I've talked to uh, Dick before the meeting I think they're actually working on some of these and you may want to speak with him after after I get done to uh, to uh, see if he has anything to add. 
the first thing I would uh, recommend is if, you know, in light that the, the difference of these two reports would be to have the uh, Briggs contact the Oklahoma Rural Water Association and have them uh, send their circuit rider out to look at their system and maybe provide a third opinion on the, on the matter and see if, uh, see if it's more in line with the uh, first engineer's report or the second engineer's report. Uh, I believe Briggs, uh, my second recommendation would be to uh, have them install, you know, the master meters and valves, and I believe that uh, Briggs is in the process of doing this so that we can prioritize where the worst areas of the system are. Uh, certainly if we don't have the money to replace the entire system, uh, we should replace the areas that are worse. Uh, the Mr. Kelly's report, his engineering report, uh, said that there were some uh, professional leak detectors that came out and failed to locate where the leaks were. Uh, it would be helpful if we had a copy of the report that they uh, submitted. Uh, and the, the report from EDM said that Mr. Vance Mooney from Sequoia County Water Association volunteered to come up and help Briggs with uh, looking at their system and seeing if he could help them locate some of the leaks. And if that was done, it would be helpful if we had something from Mr. Mooney to uh, tell us what the results of that were. Uh, it may be uh, that after we do all of this, we can find out that uh, we can replace some of the worst areas of the system and get the water loss down to an acceptable level. And once that's done, uh, Briggs may be in a position financially to start replacing some of the line themselves. But, you know, we just simply aren't in a position right now to know where those areas are because we don't know what, uh, what areas of the system are, are the worst and in uh, most urgent need of replacement. Uh. Any questions for uh, Billy Hicks? What, uh, Billy, while you're up there, I'd like to ask uh, Dick to George, uh, would you be willing to get this uh, report from Vance Mooney, Dick, to bring to Billy and let him review that report? Yes, I, yes, I would. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do is have uh, you to get all these reports together and, and go back and ask Oklahoma Rural Water Association to come out and give you a... Uh, recommendations on the thing and get with Billy and work with that water and sanitation department to see if it's something we can do to assist you out there. Uh, I'd like you to work directly with the water and sanitation program because that's where the money is going to have to come out of and for the recommendations for this uh, committee I need to have those recommendations there so if you get them from our WA and also the Mooney, uh, the Mooney report so we appreciate you getting those to Billy so we can take a look at those too. Uh, you know, I know that we have a lot of Indian folks who live out in the Briggs area there, so we want to assist you as much as we can. Uh, it's just like with Indian Health Service. I know now the, uh, the rating on that is not going to get high because you already have water out there, but there may be still some, something that Billy can do to work with that for the funding agency there. So if you get those reports, we'll certainly take a look at those at a later day. Okay? And uh, Mr. Garvin, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is the situation over at Fort Gibson still in the works for this? I, as far as I know, it would still be entertained. We have just never had any other contact with the community. They've never come back after we uh, we asked them to do those things, and, and I don't know if they have any interest in the water at this time or not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's start. Now, is uh, the situation with Bird Flat, North of Marble, mm -hmm. uh, are they having problems trying to get easements? Or? There's one landowner that we need an easement from. He lives out of state. Uh, I think he's in Tennessee. It's a it's a piece of property, I believe, that's in a uh, a trust situation, and uh, I believe uh, it was a, a person that passed away, and his children were the trustees, and one of the sons lives in Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Uh, Carter, the county commissioner, called and offered to his assistance in trying to get that easement, and we're we're working with him to see if we can find some local family that may be able to help us get that easement signed. But that easement's going to be necessary before we can do that project. Is there any way I can get that information? Sure, <coughs> sure. I can get you I the. You bet. You bet. Uh, Billy, can you uh, get with uh, Dick to George and get these two reports and come back to us next month with uh, updated sure. uh, findings on this bridge sure. the water district aid and kind of see where we are on the thing? Sure. Uh, I don't know if if water rural water association will be able to get us a report by you know by the next meeting, but if they if they do, I'd be happy to and you know. Either, either way, I'll be happy to come back and tell you that we have the report or we, and what it says or we don't. Okay. Let's do that for the next meeting then. Okay. See what happens. Okay. Uh, Rear Church Water Line, is that the one over near Chelsea, Billy? Yes. Okay. 
thank you, uh, Billy. Uh, do hang on, just Mr. Jack Beck. Are you also looking at the needs of other water districts all across the Cherokee Nation? Sure. Uh, anytime uh, any district has any problems, they're welcome to come to us. We've we work with districts everywhere from up Copan to Muldrow. But are are you now looking at the problems that they have overall? Because I'm assuming that we also have an engineer's report for Real Water District Number Nine in Mays County. Yes. And it's, but I'm assuming there's others. Yes, there's, there are others that are in similar situations. There sure are. And we, we work with them and try to get funding where, where it's available to help them out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bill. You bet. Yes, Mr. Sullivan. I've got those income limits. Just going to mention oh. that the uh, for any of the NAHASDA programs, it's 80% of the national median and, and below. Okay. So I've got those. I'll just hand them out. I think there's one in there for Shelley also. Okay. Uh, Ms. Woodward, would you come back up to the podium for a minute? We have a, a question. Uh, I think uh, it came from one of my uh, one of our council members that uh, about the donated food program. The question was: if we have uh, some elderlies out in the uh, jurisdictional boundaries that that uh, are taking care of some grandkids and taking care of uh, you know great grandkids and things like that and and they're having some problems with food right now because of the gas prices and just don't have enough income. Uh, what do do you have an income guideline? I know we do have an income guideline for donated food, but is there any exceptions for those guidelines? I can't answer that. Uh, not knowing that much about donated food, you're correct. There is an income guideline. What that is, I do not know, but I can give that question to them and have that have them send it to you. And the other thing, is there any exceptions to that guideline as far as the grandparents is taking care of grandkids? Does that count as part of their uh, family? I guess it would. I, anything I would say would be speculation, but <coughs> from what I thought, what I think I know, which is not much, is that the, it's based on the family income and the number of people in that home. And it's, it's pretty straightforward that way, but I will get that answer, an exact answer back to you. So I guess in order to uh, for the grandparents to have to be eligible for that, they would actually have to have guardianship of those grandkids, or uh, we just need to I know, don't know about that. Policy about it. It's current. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I've run into in the past is that what happens are, are these parents? They may be working, they may not be working, and they're already drawing food stamps or or their own, you know, get get the food distribution. And the grandparent doesn't actually count in in that situation. And what it is happening is they're taking those children and putting them off on the grandparents during the day or during the afternoon or during the night. Then the grandparents having to feed those people, and maybe they're not even drawing three, four, five hundred dollars a month, but it's a big burden on those people. And we need to really look into that. Because I know before we couldn't do anything about it, and that's been six, seven years ago. But you're right, Jim Silver has the problem. There's lots of problems out there like that. And we need to really look into that and try to figure out some way that we can get those grandparents uh, some type of food distribution through, through the Cherokee Nation. And that's just the way I feel about it. There hadn't ever anybody ever done anything about it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any more questions about it? Uh, if you would check into that to see if there's any exceptions uh, that we can do, uh, we'd certainly like to uh, do something for the grandparents. Okay. Any more questions for Ms. Woodward? If you'd get that back to us, we would appreciate it. We'll do. The other thing that, uh, that brought to my attention, about two months ago, we had... Uh, and this committee has uh, formed a subcommittee for our housing. And apparently, uh, we had a uh, recommendation for it or a resolution, but we didn't get a second on it. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is if we'd still like to do it, I'd like for uh, someone to make that resolution to see if we still want to have one. Ms. Jordan. I would make a motion that we develop a subcommittee to uh, begin the process of, of uh, 
working towards next year's IHP plan. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. So now what I'd like to do, I don't think that, uh, well, I say I don't think we could, but I'd like to have volunteers to serve on that committee, and then we need to pick a time so we can have the uh, time to have that committee to meet. But uh, who all would want to serve on that committee? I'll serve on it for one. We have Ms. Jordan, Ms. Fishing Hawk. Snail, uh, Mr. Soap, Mr. Crittenden, Janelle Fulbright, uh, Mr. Baker Will, uh, according to Ms. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if this is acceptable to everyone, then this committee will, will be formed, and then now we need to figure out what the time frame we're going to have the meeting on, and I think we had that figured out the last time, and I don't remember when that was. Seemed like it was right after the uh, Was it not going to be right after Hill? On the same day? Was that what we talked about, Harley? Because Hill's at 10 and then we have that gap between 10 and 1. Yes, and I'm wondering if I need to put a full hour for that uh, subcommittee meeting. Uh, could we do the? Could we set it up at uh, let's see, 10, 30, at 11:15, and then uh, say if health committee ends at 11 o'clock, then we'll just take right off after the health committee. Is that acceptable? Or we have to have set times? I want to make sure we leave it up meeting for our health health meetings. So those kind of run long at times. I don't see Mr. Cobb in here. Do you need a motion to that thing? Yes, we will. Uh, I would make a motion that for our first meeting, we uh, have it at 11.15 after, 11.15 on the same day, I guess that would be the, uh, how can I describe that, be the, uh, right after the health committee meeting monthly. Okay, I have a motion for the uh, housing subcommittee at 11.15 on the same day as health committee. I don't see Mr. Cobb. I think I'd like to check to see if it's okay with him because I don't want to get into his time. Or immediately follow. Do you want to? Well, Shelly said we need a time set on the thing so we can post those times. Yes, I think we would. Uh, uh, Meredith, would you hold it, uh, Dr. Cobb? And see if, I, I want to make sure it's okay with him before we go for the motion. <laughs> Uh, we could do a working lunch. Let's see what Dr. Collins says. Mm -hmm. Dr. Collins, we were trying to set up a Housing subcommittee meeting, and we want to get it the day you have your health committee meeting. And I don't want to uh, go into your time limit, so we said 11:15. That gives you an hour and 15 minutes for health. Uh, we want to check and see if that's okay with you. And even if health ran over, you know that's not going to be a big problem because we know our speaker she ran over yesterday, and so we just continue having meetings. But uh, yes. we want to make sure it's okay with you. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have a motion to have that 11:15? Paul. I make that motion. Okay. The motion's been made. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. We have a motion and second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. So, mm -hmm. next month we'll have a meeting at that time, 11:15. And I believe that ends the uh, agenda for our community services meeting. So uh, next meeting is tentatively set for July 15th at 9 o'clock. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, same time. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <coughs>
No, I mean, we're not. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know how accessible it is to the road or water. Yeah. 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 Yeah.